Good morning. How are we doing? Good. It's good to be with you. My name is Alex, and I'm one of the pastors here at Fellowship Bible. Uh, and again, just to add my welcome onto that of Toby's, uh, thank you for being here today. We're glad that you're here. And if you're visiting and we haven't met yet, I'd love to have the opportunity to do that right after the service. Uh, I'll be out in the lobby, so come by, introduce yourself, and uh, let's shake hands or fist bump or high five or whatever, elbows, whatever you feel comfortable uh, doing, but I'd love to get to know you uh, right after the service. And I will say this, I don't typically uh, throw fellow staff members under the bus, but um, Toby has a reason to be a little bit scatterbrained because his wife is due any minute. And, and, and so like early signs have been happening like, like for over the last six or seven days. And so we're just going to cut him some slack, right? It's good. Yeah, it's good. He has a good excuse to be a little bit scatterbrained. And so anyway, that was awesome. It was pure entertainment. <laughs> and then um, and then I want to invite you to starting point. If you're here and you're like, oh, my goodness, I've been planning on coming and I just forgot to register. Would you come anyway? Uh, we'd love to have you. It's just a great opportunity to hear more about uh, our church and what God's doing here and what our plans are for the future and get to meet our staff We've got seven or eight people, I think, signed up, and, and we can have a, a few more. And, and so if that's you and you're here and, and you forgot, or maybe you don't have lunch plans and you just want a free meal, um, just join us down. And the, uh, there'll be hundreds of people there now. <laughs> Shoot. Um, yeah, just join us down in the loft. also want to let you know before we dive in, um, uh, we had an associate pastor candidate, Clay Smith, who was in town, I, I forget, it was three or four weeks ago. Now, just wanted to let you know that our combined board of elders and deacons met about a week and a half ago, and uh, uh, after we received all the congregational feedback and evaluations, uh, that combined board met and agreed to extend an, an offer uh, to Clay and Heather and their family to join us, and they have re um, received that offer, and they have accepted that offer. And so they'll be joining us uh, sometime, probably late April, uh, early May. They will be in town the 1st of April, house hunting. It's kind of a, a uh, Heather, the, his wife, is a school teacher. She kind of needs to finish this semester, and they have a senior in high school. And this would be a terrible time uh, to move a senior in high school. She has like seven weeks of school left, and so they're probably going to finish the school year there and then come uh, join us uh, on staff. And so uh, I'm super excited about that. I hope you're excited about that uh, as well. It's going uh, to be some good stuff uh, happening around here. And so we're excited to share that news with you. Uh, speaking of the news, uh, let's just dive in. If you watch the news or pay attention uh, to what's happening and going on in our society, it's hard in recent years um, to avoid the rise and increase uh, I guess a way to put it would be w with m mental health awareness, just things like that going on in our society. Um, it's hard to avoid partly because we live in a more connected, more informed society, uh, but it's also because the number of cases of those who wrestle with those types of issues is on the rise as well. In fact, you could say that, that mental health issues are like of epidemic proportions. In fact, when, when you look at a list, and I'm just going to put a list on the screen, a list of, of some of uh, the primary mental health disorders, what we're talking about are things like this, anxiety, depression, uh, panic, phobias, all kinds of different phobias, um, OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, um, ADD, attention deficit disorder, bipolar, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. I mean, the list kind of goes on and on and on and on. But leading that list at the top there is anxiety. In fact, I was looking up some statistics. Anxiety disorders are the most common mental illness, uh, if you will, in the United States. An estimated uh, uh, over, I think it's 40 million people, adults ages 18 and over, deal with anxiety. That's almost 20% of the population. I mean, if you were to do the math in here, there's roughly 400 people uh, in here right now. That means 80 of us. I think I did the math right in that. Uh, 80 of us or so have wrestled or are wrestling with or have in the past or will 
and the future deal with anxiety. And I think that that statistic's actually a little bit higher uh, simply because uh, those are just the cases that are reported and have been diagnosed by health professionals. There's lots of people who deal with anxiety that never go to the doctor and never get a diagnosis. So maybe it impacts 25, 30% or more of the population. In fact, I think it's even more than that because all of us, to a certain degree, wrestle with anxiety or have anxieties about certain issues on, with certain things. Uh, for instance, uh, how many of you have stage fright? Like the thought of doing what I'm doing right now, standing up here with lights on you and a microphone around your head, having to talk for the next 30 minutes about the Bible and keep people's attention, uh, that just scares you to death. Like some of you are just sweating right now. Your hands are, oh, I could never, ever do that. Uh, You think about when you get a new job. Some of you have. uh, All of us probably have felt like those first day at the new job jitters. Uh, Or maybe it's not the first day at the job, maybe it's the first day at school, and you're like, oh my goodness, is my teacher going to like me? Am I going to have to sit in the front or the back? Are my fellow students going to like me? Are my coworkers going to like me? Am I going to get along with them? Am I going to like the job? Like We have all of these anxieties that go with things like that. Parents, uh, how about this? I'm looking over here at the whites. Uh, How about when your kid gets their driver's license? (laughs) They have a new 16-year-old in their house. I mean, like, that is scary when the kids get a driver's license, and then you extend the, the, the curfew, and, and now they're out till 11 o'clock, and you cannot sleep. I mean, you just have to wait for them to get home. I mean, we all have experienced anxieties uh, at different levels, but we've all experienced it at some point in our lives. And since none of us are immune... That also means this, and I need you to hear me say this, that Christians are not immune from fear and anxiety either. And how do I know that? Well, Jesus cares enough to talk about it. And so this is something that we all have wrestled with, will wrestle with, or, um, you know, at some point in our lives. So it's appropriate that we deal with it this morning. Having said that, if you have your Bible, I want to invite you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. We've been in a series on the Sermon on the Mount, and it's Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. We are closing out chapter 6 today, have a few more weeks. We'll take a break from this series next week, and then uh, we'll wrap it up as we head towards Easter. And today we're going to look together at what Jesus has to say about fear and anxiety. And I'll just give you the heads up now um, that when Jesus talks about fear and anxiety, he does so in a way that's uncomfortable. He does it in such a way where I think what he wants to do is just come alongside us, put his arm around us, and kind of walk us through fear and anxiety uh, to the other side so that he can kind of point back and show us that maybe we didn't have a lot to be afraid of in the first place. And so Matthew chapter 6, let's look at this. Uh, Remember when we left off last week, Jesus had, had just addressed our treasure He talked about uh, uh, um, storing up for yourselves treasures in heaven, not here on earth, uh, telling us not to be so concerned about our stuff, and and then picking up in verse 25, he's just continuing this theme of our stuff, our treasure, our finances, and Jesus uses a couple of things that we all have in common here, Um, food and clothing. Let's look. Verse 25, he says, therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. What you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? One of the ways Jesus is cueing us in on how fear and anxiety works is by saying, be careful what value you give certain things. I mean, he started talking about that last week, and he's just continuing on this week because it's, it's like, because the more value you give specific things, the more fear and anxiety is going to rule and reign around those things, y- y- your stuff, your trophies, your treasure, your money, your finances, your things, all of this sort of stuff. He's like, if you hold too tightly the things that you shouldn't be holding on to tightly, then, then fear and anxiety is going to creep into your life. 
See, when you're talking about fear and anxiety, or as Jesus is talking about fear and anxiety, here's what I think he's really talking about. I think he's really, truly talking about who do you ultimately give rule and reign and authority to in your life? Like what, what are the, who um, has sovereign rule, reign, and authority in your life? He, and Jesus is like, hey, when you misplace your priorities, when you, when you put your priorities on your stuff, then fear and anxiety is going to increase. And then he wants us to consider something here. He says, verse 26, look at the birds of the air. It's like, they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And so I think most of us understand this. Jesus is saying here that if God provides and takes care of the birds, which are kind of seemingly significant, although they're part of his creation, he's like, if God cares to take care of them, then how much more so is he going to take care of you and I, like humans, people made in his image? And this is important. Uh, because the anxiety that many of us experience in this life is rooted in a low understanding of our personal value before God. And, and so, like, I just think we fail to comprehend how much God loves us and cares for us. And so he's trying to give us some of that perspective. He cares about the birds. If he cares about those things, then how much more does he care about you? And then I love the next thing Jesus says, although it can be a little difficult to hear. He says this, and which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And this is obviously a rhetorical question, um, because the answer is none of us, right? I mean, he's literally, this is another way, Jesus, by asking this rhetorical question, it, it, in essence, is just saying, hey, quit torturing yourself. You cannot extend your life. Don't worry about this stuff. And then he says, verse 28, and why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field. And this is where he's going to walk us through fear a little bit. He says, consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, pause. I need to explain this. I need to explain this last phrase in particular for all of this, I think, to make sense, this phrase thrown into the oven. So many times we read scripture and we just skip through things like this. And so Jesus, I think, is trying to communicate something here with this little word picture. You see, in the first century, they made bread daily. I mean, that's why a little bit earlier in the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus was teaching his disciples to pray, he told them to pray for their daily bread, right? Because they made bread daily. And one of the ways that they would make this bread, or really about how they would make it all the time, is they would cut down the grass in the field. They would use wood if they had wood, but this is a very like kind of desert, kind of uh, more prairie grassland type kind of topography over there. And so they would cut down the grass, and that's what they would use to fuel the ovens to bake their daily bread. And so here's what Jesus is alluding to. Jesus is saying, hey, just like that grass one day is alive and well, and the next day it's chopped down and thrown into the oven. I, I think Jesus is not shying away from the fact that you and I one day are most certainly going to die. Th this is what he's talking about here. This is where it gets uncomfortable. In fact, at this point, it's 1115. We are 45 minutes closer to death than when we started this worship service. We, we don't know when. We don't know the hour, and yet Jesus says, if God is so detailed and particular about the lilies of the field and the birds and how these lilies of the field are arrayed in splendor and how he's taking care of feeding the birds, then how much more value are you and I to him? Again, this just goes back to who we're trusting who is, who is ruling and reigning over our hearts. 
Okay, let's look at verse 30 again, and we'll continue. He says, but if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. Okay, so this is good news. Jesus has just thrown out here the weapon that we've been given to fight fear and anxiety. And it's ultimately this, that, that God is the one who ultimately rules and reigns over our lives. And he does so in such a way that is better than the way that we reign and rule over our own lives, right? It's much better when he's in charge than when we're in charge. Um, this whole issue of anxiety is not something that's really foreign uh, to me at all. In fact, it was Tuesday, uh, August the 10th, 2010. It was a normal day. Uh, like any other day, I was an associate pastor at a very large church in the Austin area. I'd been there uh, at that church seven years, uh, or actually longer than that, almost 10 years, serving on staff for about uh, seven or eight years at the time. Normal day, I'd gone to the office, done my work. We had had staff meeting. I came home, ate dinner with the family around the dinner table uh, like we normally do. We play a, played a little game called uh, 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 Sad, Mad, Glad or glad, mad, sad. It was one of those things. I never understood the game because we would go around the table and we would share one thing that, was, that made us sad that day, one thing that made us mad, and one thing that made us glad. And it was like two of those things are bad. It's like maybe you should just do what made us glad today. I don't know. Anyway, well, we played a game around the table. Uh, I'm, I'm sure I washed the dishes because that's a rule in our house when he cooks. I washed the dishes uh, and then watched TV and went to bed. It was a normal day. And then somewhere, after drifting off to sleep, somewhere around 1 a.m. in the morning, uh, I woke up, just shot up straight out of bed, and my heart was pounding in my chest, like, like I could feel it just physically, just beating, pounding, pounding, pounding. Uh, I had pain in my chest. My uh, fingers were tingly. My arms were numb. I felt weak. I mean, if I didn't know any better, I actually, in the moment, I thought, like, I'd never had a heart attack. I was 42 years old. I'd never had a heart attack, but I thought, man, I think I'm having a heart attack right now. I don't know what's going on. And like most men who are, are kind of stubborn, I didn't bother to wake Wendy up or to dial 911. I thought, oh, I'm just going to gut this out. You know, I'm not really sure what's going on. I don't want to bother anybody, so I'm just going to, like, try to shake it off for a little bit. Um, but here's what happened. Uh, I spent the next four hours marching loops around my house, just praying that God wouldn't let me die. I just, I walked through the kitchen into our formal dining room. I would make a left into the entryway, uh, into a, a den area, and, and I walked through there, and then back to the entryway, and then back to our living room. I would circle around that in front of the fireplace, into the breakfast nook, and back through the kitchen. And I just walked loops, like laps around my house, four hours straight, periodically just falling to my knees and saying, Lord, please don't let me die. Like this, it was terrible. And uh, by God's grace, after about four hours, around five o'clock in the morning, uh, my heart rate, the pulse had, had come down, the pain had subsided, I'd now had feeling uh, back in my arms, and, and I was like, I don't know what just happened, and uh, I know I didn't die. Um, and that's it. That's all I knew at the time. And so I'm going to crawl back in bed, slept a couple hours, got up around 7 o'clock, still very concerned about what had just happened, called my family doctor, Dr. Ron DeWitt. Uh, he got me in immediately that morning, put me through a bunch of tests, a heart test, the EKG, uh, blood test, urinalysis, like all kinds of stuff. And, and after we run all this test, he calls me back to his office and he goes, well, here's the deal. Um, you're not having a heart attack right now. And all the tests that I, I just did, I, um, they would pretty much tell me uh, if you're having one currently. And so here's what I can tell you. you, you you're you not having one right now. And then he said the most uncomforting thing any doctor's ever said to me. He said, but you could leave my office right now and have a heart attack. <laughs> I'm like, thanks? Like, I don't, 
what is that? It brings me zero comfort right now. Um, he said, but here's the deal. I don't think you had a heart attack. He said, I think you had a panic attack. And I was like, what? No, I did not. That is, no, sir. In fact, do you, anybody know who Stuart Scott is, the famous ESPN sportscaster? He always had this line. He used to say, that guy is cooler than the other side of the pillow. Like, that was me. Like, I was that guy. In fact, like, if the building caught fire right now, I'd be like, hey, could you guys do me a favor right now? Uh, would you all just exit out these side doors right here, okay? This section, would you, there's an exit. Would you just head that way? And everybody remain calm. We'll see you outside. It's a nice day. We'll just continue the service outside. Like, super cool, calm, and collected. I was a believer. I was a pastor. Uh, I knew the Lord. I knew in whom I had placed my faith and trust. I knew who was my rock my refuge, and my anchor. No way was I having a panic attack. And I'd love to tell you that that was the end of the story, um, that, that it never happened again. But that event um, was just the first domino in what would be the next two to four years of dealing with anxiety on a very like daily basis um, and panic attacks every uh, week, every couple of days, um, for the next several years. In fact, I was, because it continued on, I, I was eventually diagnosed with general anxiety disorder and a panic uh, disorder. Um, I didn't like the feeling of anxiety and panic. Uh, so an attempt to cure that part of my life, I did what most people do, uh, you listen to your doctor, and Dr. DeWitt was like, here, I want you to take this uh, medicine. I don't want to give you Xanax, because Xanax, it really works, but you'll get addicted to it. So I don't want you to take that. I want to give you this other one. And so he gave me this other medication, and I started to take that medication. Had an adverse reaction to that medication. It ended up uh, taking an ambulance ride uh, because of the adverse reaction to the medication. And he's like, well, cut the dose in half, and cut the dose in half, and it happened again. And I was like, okay. This, I feel helpless now. Meds don't even work, you know? And so then I just said, well, I'm going to beat this without medication. And, and so I'm going to start doing all the other things that they tell you. And so I cut out all the fun things in life, like coffee and ice cream. And, you know, like I had to cut back on my caffeine and sugar. And I started to exercise a little bit more and take B12 supplements and, you know, drink smooth, like all the things to try to get on top of this anxiety and panic. I even did myofacial release therapy. You know what that is? This is a fancy way to say light massage, <laughs> you know? And myofacial release therapy. I, I would just get still before the Lord, and I would just pray, and I'd read Scripture. Um, and the honest truth is, is and then I'd wake up the next day and be anxious all over again and have a panic attack. Again, it was just a cycle that continued and continued and continued. But the one thing that I didn't do, or that I wasn't doing at the time, is I wasn't stopping and saying, you know, what caused this? Like, what's the root cause here? Like, what, why is this even happening? What, what, what triggered, you know, this thing? And once I did that, once I was able to stop, well, I, I realized, you know, 2010 was a pretty difficult year for me. Early in that year, one of our children, who was a teenager at the time, had, had experienced uh, something pretty traumatic that we were dealing with as a family together. Uh, I had decided to, in an effort to get out into the community even though I was an associate pastor at the time, that I was going to run for local office. And so I ran for the local school board. And so I'd spent months and months and months uh, out of the house and, you know, working all day, but, but then working on campaign and going and making appearances and speeches and standing out in front of schools and getting the vote out. And it's been an extremely stressful year. I did end up winning that election and that campaign in May. And then the very next month in June, my grandmother, Granny, is what I called her. She uh, passed unexpectedly. Um, and she is the one that, you know, made sure when I was a little kid not growing up in church, she made sure that I was at church. 
I mean, she was kind of the first person that was just super close to me that I'd lost in life. Then I told you I was working at a church, but even though I was working at a church and serving the Lord, it was an extremely toxic work environment. In fact, the, I think the triggering event that, that triggered the, this panic attack that night was that just three days or four days before, that happened on a Tuesday, it was the Friday before I had interviewed for a job uh, as a pastor at a church just down the street from the church I was serving. I was so desperate to get out that I was just like, hey, if this church down the street's hiring, I guess I'll look there. And so I had that interview on Friday, uh, and then the panic attack happened late Tuesday night, early Wednesday morning. Wednesday, I was scheduled to have another meeting with another person about another job. And, and so when I look back on it all, I was able to see all of these events that led up to this, and I realized that deep down, it was a struggle for control. I wanted to be in charge. I didn't like how things were going, and I wanted to be able to fix it all, my own power and my own strengths. In fact, one of the most merciful things that the good Lord has ever done for me was to allow me to understand that all the control that I thought I had in this life is just an illusion. It's mercy. And as weird as that may sound to you, it was comforting to my soul to just be finally laying in bed one night and go, you know what, God? I can't deal with this. <laughs> There's nothing I can do here. I can't make me any better. I can't make this anxiety any better. I can't make the panic stop. I have zero power over this, zero control. I mean, honestly, what's going to save me? Like not having coffee and drinking more smoothies and taking more supplements and no that stuff's not going to make it go away those things aren't going to save me from what's most assuredly coming for me like the grass of the field right which is death that's coming the lord's marked out my days my confidence and my faith and my trust needs to be in him it needs to be in that God knows what he's doing. And when you can finally get there, God, I trust you and I know what you're doing and I know that you're in control. It's the most freeing thing that you can ever experience. It's a truly freeing thing to understand you have no control. And isn't that terrifying to you control freaks? Right now you're trying to figure out how you can control your lack of control. It's true. And it's into that fear and anxiety. Jesus says, oh, you of little faith. Like the worst thing you can do is pretend like fear and anxiety aren't real. Or pretend that you're strong and you don't have it. Let's keep going here. The next thing he says here is in verse 33. He says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. And so it's like in seeking his kingdom, here's what you get. You get God. And he's enough. Sometimes fear and anxiety will lead you to experience more of him. And so he's like, seek first his kingdom. And now here's where we see the compassion of Jesus around this issue of anxiety uh, begin to take place. So he says in verse 34, therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. By the way, I didn't tell you, um, you know what the definition of anxious is? It's basically caring too much. Isn't that, isn't that interesting? That's literally what it, it's like, you just care too much about whatever thing it is, whatever that thing is in life that's bringing you anxiety, it's you care too much. And into that, Jesus is like, stop caring so much. I mean, this is a great line. Um, and here's why 
It's like if all your fears are on tomorrow, you have no capacity to enjoy the goodness of God today. I mean, so today, listen, I'm relatively healthy. I mean, I'm 55, I'm getting older, so things are starting to break down a little bit, but I'm relatively healthy. My kids are doing well, and they're healthy, and my marriage has never been better. Started this great job, this great church six months ago. They haven't kicked me out yet, and so things are going really well in life. I mean, I just have nothing to complain about. I get to spend today celebrating the Lord. I've had the privilege of worshiping with you, my church family. I get the opportunity to stand up here and talk about Jesus and God's word with you for a little bit. After this, I get to go to starting point and hopefully get to meet some new people and see if some of those folks want to jump into how we're doing life at fellowship. I mean, all day long, I get to be tired in the Lord. I mean, this is a good day, and I'm not thinking about tomorrow. And then finally, here, here's where we're really going to see the compassion of Jesus. Look at this last line. He says, sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So let me tell you why I think this is a super compassionate statement. You and I were just given permission to deal with anxiety and fear. Today, if we have fear and anxiety, what do we do? We give it over to the Lord. We, we, we don't let it compound with tomorrow's trouble. We, we simply stay in today. I, I really want to drive this point home. Um, I love what Pastor Matt Chandler at the Village Church in the Dallas-Fort Worth area says about this. He said this, most, not all, but most fear and anxiety is rooted in the fact that we simply don't trust that God is good. I, I'm, I just believe that. In fact, I wish I would have said it or wrote it or thought it. There is no freedom from anxiety if you can't say to God, if you can't have that moment where you say to God, you know what, God, I don't trust that you're good. I don't trust that you're for my good right now. I don't trust that you have my best intentions right now. I, I don't trust that this situation that I feel like you're working, I don't think it's going to work out. I don't think it's going to work out, God. I don't trust you. That's why I have to deal with this stuff. That's why I have to try and make it better. It's like until you get to that place, until you get to that point, well, where you're willing to admit that the reason that you have fear and worry and panic and anxiety is because you think you know better and you don't trust God. It's not until you get there that you can finally have that moment where you're like, oh, this really is on me. <laughs> That's not about him. Until you can get to that place where you're like, God, I don't think that ultimately you're going to be for my good. See, it's when you get there that you can, the, the, that you can finally allow or, or the Holy Spirit just takes over and begins to accomplish what the Holy Spirit does and what you can't do on your own, and that is be honest with who we actually are. Jesus says, today has enough trouble of its own. And so friends, here's what I want to say to you. Then let's deal with it. Today. Let's deal with it today. Like whatever it is that is going on in your life, you just say, Lord, this thing that I feel very anxious about right now, this thing that I'm caring too much about, just confess that to him. Say, Lord, th this is what it is. Here's what I'm anxious about. Even if it's something that you feel like people would make fun of you for, just turn it over. Lay it down. 
God is good. You can trust him. Your heavenly father knows what you need. So he cares about the birds and he cares about the lilies of the field and he cares way more deeply about you. And so if you're experiencing fear or worry or anxiety and panic, just lay it down at his feet today. He cares for you. He loves you. And he wants you to experience his love and his goodness. So lay it down. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me for just a moment? And Father, we know that in this room right now that there are various ones of us that are dealing with things in life um, that uh, we care an awful lot about. And those things bring us a lot of fear and anxiety. And we read your word and it compels us to not care so much about those things. It compels us to not be anxious. It compels us to give up control over our own lives and place our lives and then everything that happens uh, in our lives to place those things in your hands. Ultimately, it's just a recognition, God, that you are the ultimate authority. You're the ultimate rule and reign. And so my prayer um, for those today that are in here, maybe watching online at home or will watch this later, is, um, Lord, that we would just first admit that, that, we, that we're trying to control things. And that we can't. And so we start there and we admit that. And then these things that consume us or that we're worried about, we just lay them at your feet. And we let you and your incredible capacity with billions of people on this planet, we allow you uh, to be in charge and to rule, and to reign. God, not to worry about it for us, because you're not worried. Because you're working things out for our good. And so we trust you, and we believe you, and we step into that, even though it's very difficult to do. We love you, we trust you, and we pray all of this. In the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you for being here today. It's been an incredible day together. Um, I do want to invite you uh, back next week. I'm pretty excited. Next week is WOW weekend. And so I tell people all the time, being the, the new-ish pastor here, can we say I'm not the new guy anymore? Can we just all agree with that? Okay. Um, but still being newish, and in my first year, I've yet, I, I'm having this year of experiencing all my firsts, and so this will be my first wow uh, weekend, and so I'm looking forward to it, and I hope that you'll avail yourself of all the opportunities of coming next Friday night and eating some good food. Let's just all get fat and happy together next Friday night. And then, uh, nobody wants to get fat and happy? I don't know. It's just a saying. Let's just all eat some good food next Friday night, and then... Uh, uh, take advantage of the, the movie opportunities on Saturday. And then, I mean, maybe the best part about next week is Pastor Sam and his wife Ruthie will be here next Sunday to share. And so that's going to be uh, awesome. You still can't have him as your pastor? <laughs> There's a, a no refund policy. And so anyway, um, but they'll be with us next week. It's going to be a great Sunday. I, I hope you'll uh, come back. So we'll take a break from that series, Sermon on the Mount, one week, and then we'll We'll come back the following week, okay? Hey, would you stand and uh, let's read our benediction out loud together. Father, help us to live this week to the full, 
being true to you in every way. Jesus, help us to give ourselves away to others, being kind to everyone we meet. And Holy Spirit, help us to love the lost, proclaiming Christ in all we do and say. Amen. You're dismissed.